artists love to test boundaries. And the best artists are known for pushing convention a little too far. But how else does one grow? To test boundaries, one must know what they are. And that means examining what it is one does as an artist and doing that in a very critical and methodical way. Of the many styles and movements of modern and postmodern art, few are more methodical than distill, which was inspired by artists pushing boundaries with Dada. And these movements create art in a very methodical way. Dada applies a method to context as it applies to the expression, exposing an abstraction that can't be materialized in the form itself, only fully realized in the mind of the audience. The terms of the expression are reductive and minimalized, which is one reason why the first computer-generated art using algorithms mimicked the style, this methodology of reducing some aspect of the creative process into a nascent element of the process. This is a clue to thinking like a generative artist. Reduction and minimalization are major aspects of the creative process in generative art. When something is reduced from its complex form to one that strips away all the superfluousness, What's left are the rules for describing only that primitive form. It may still be recognizable, but only in the most abstract or generic sense. From those rules used to describe the primitive form, you can devise the expression without providing any specifics. The magic of this kind of expression is that its experience is fully appreciated in the mind of the observer, since all the contextual information has been obliterated by the reductive process. The primitive expression depends on the observer for context, thus a transformative process occurs. All one needs to do is apply the rules to create a primitive expression, and the observer expands it into something of meaning or aesthetic value. So far, we have the notion that generative artists reduce complex forms into the rules of an expression. This is distinctly different from practical expression done with painting, sculpting, dancing, or composing music. Those each have their own distinct rules and methodologies that require the artist to think within the framework of the medium. Generative art has a particular framework in that it doesn't really have one that resembles tradition. The framework for generative art uses algorithms, so there's that, but those algorithms are something the artist constructs. Think about how this would work in practical art. Say I invent a new kind of paint, a non-Newtonian paint that requires a completely different technique and methodology for painting with it. I expect the art I create will be unbelievable, but I don't know what I'm doing because it's brand new. And this happens in practical art. A new tool or a material is invented that gives rise to a new style or a movement of art, but it's not every day. In generative art, I'll be making new stuff every time I design a generative system. So I'm constantly at a disadvantage when working with the medium because most of the time the tools and materials I'm using are ones that I haven't put together before. I may not know what to expect. If you're a practical artist who needs structure and objectives with tools and materials you know how to use and create with, well then you're thinking like a practical artist, which is good if you want to do practical art. However, if you want to think like a generative artist, you'll have to cast certainty to the wind. I can't tell you how many times I've been utterly surprised by the expression that emerges from the rules I've fastened together into some crude structure. And this is, for me at least, the most satisfying and compelling aspect of creating generative art. I love the mystery, I love the problem solving, I love the solutions and everything in between. And it's a good thing because designing a generative system for making art is all about mystery, problem solving, and everything in between. If you need a tool in practical art but you can't find one, you accept it and move on. In generative art, if you need a tool, you make one. You make tools you don't know if you need them or not. You accidentally make tools. Tools practically make themselves and each tool provides an opportunity to add some element or complexity to an expression. A common method for planning this process is to list the steps that will be used to complete some expression. And the artist is left to interpret from the steps the algorithms that will be involved and how they'll fit together. For this to work well, the artist must be well versed in the primitive functionality of the algorithms as well as being able to augment them properly in order to fit cleanly within a series of procedures. This might be analogous to a painter concerned with how the hand applies pressure, moves the pigment, creates the strokes, notices the change in the fluidity or viscosity, and adjusts those variables appropriately. Of course, this is about technique, and it generally is something an artist improves with practice and instruction. Technique in generative art is as much about the coding procedures as it is about the principles of art and design, so it's hard to stay away from a focus on the computer math aspect. 
It's like painting while you know nothing about paint. Sure, you can still paint, but your work's not going to demonstrate a nuanced understanding of the material. How then does an artist pick up coding as a medium? You learn one procedure or algorithm at a time. You get to know it. You make it do as much as you can imagine it doing, then try something else until you're satisfied you've gotten all you can out of it. And then move on to the next one. And this time you do the same thing, but before you move on, you go backward. Take the procedures you've already learned and try combining them in different ways. See what you can get out of them. Once you have all the major procedures practiced and learned, you're ready for the next stage, design methodology. And don't let the term scare you, it's just a fancy way of saying a system for putting procedures together in novel ways. There are many design methodologies out there, and the most common is simply a step list, where the instructions for the design are listed as steps the program takes to generate output. This works well enough when you understand the final intent of the output. In practice, the step list may actually be derived from the final product, that is, the code has already been created and a formal list of the procedures is generated from that already created code. The list helps others copy your work, but it doesn't do much in terms of guiding a design that hasn't been coded yet. Process structure is a methodology that uses the type of algorithms as ingredients and a list as directions for combining and cooking them into some dish. Using the cooking analogy is a way of relating the creative process using code to something we can all understand. The best part about the final product is you don't have to eat it, you just have to look at it and say, it needs more seasoning. Generative design is a lot like cooking. It's an imprecise science that requires a good deal of interpretation and intuition to do really well, but most home cooks can make something pretty tasty nonetheless. The difference between a home cook and a chef is the difference between reading a recipe and designing a dish. How does a chef design a dish? Well, a chef knows what ingredients work well together, and there are rules in cooking where it's rare for certain flavors and textures to go well together. It may not be impossible, but a good chef knows to avoid those things, else be extremely thoughtful in how they do it. A chef also knows what components are necessary to create something that's balanced and well-rounded. From the onset, a chef knows what will work together and what parts are necessary in order to make something that's not just sufficient, but outstanding. Also, a chef's building on the knowledge that's already been established, as well as adding their own personal touches. I use something I call process structure. It recognizes the things that work well together and the aspects that will make those things balanced and well-rounded in terms of the output they'll generate. To begin an exploration of process structure, let's first look at the kinds of ingredients we have to work with. At the risk of mixing analogies, the ingredients should apply to art in order to stay within a similar realm of creativity. So from here on, I'll be drawing parallels between practical and generative art. Movement's something I've talked about before in generative design, not to be confused with the design principle of movement, which describes how the work's experienced as a movement of perception by the viewer. Movement in generative design is the change in value represented by any given variable. We can give some meaning to the change by assigning it a function in the process. For instance, we can use a change in x and a change in y to represent location. We can use a change in vx and vy to represent a velocity and a direction. We can think of movement as change in the system and a change in the system as some kind of movement through its values, which can represent the state of something. Is it moving? How fast? In what direction? Does it change color? Is it random? Is it sinusoidal? All of these questions are answered by the movement pillar of the process structure method. There are other pillars too, like the tool pillar, the material pillar, and the substrate pillar. Each covers an aspect of the creative control an artist has over algorithmic procedures and their arrangement. Let's look at the tool pillar. Conceptually, it functions as the brush. It's what the movement is applied to. The brush can be a system of particles or a system of a system of particles. However convoluted you'd like it to be within functional reason, a brush can be a very abstract thing. The brush carries a location or a set of locations that impart as output some distinct mark. And the mark is imparted through the graphic attributes of color, scale, opacity, etc. This leads into the material pillar, wherein the graphics attributes play a major role. With the movement, you have locality. With the tool, you're given the texture and subformative geometries to put in that locality. With the material, you use the subformative geometries 
with changes in color, opacity, gradient, delineation, blending, etc. to make an impression on the substrate. Now we have the last pillar, the substrate pillar. Changes in output over time can result in a saturation of pattern wherein the impression is lost. There are procedures that can compensate for this in various ways. Many of those procedures function through the previously mentioned pillars, but there are some procedures that affect how the output's refreshed and layered. The algorithms that relate to how the output's manipulated, once it's generated mathematically, falls under the substrate pillar. One of the most basic procedures for this accumulates the output by not refreshing the canvas each frame. This procedure falls under the substrate pillar almost exclusively. Many procedures will fall under some or all pillars, so understanding how a procedure will be used in terms of the part of the system it affects will be crucial to using process structure as a creative methodology. Of course, as you work with the procedures more, you'll become more skilled at this, likely to the point of it being second nature and very intuitive. You may begin to forget the pillars themselves and just recall a set of procedures that affects the systems. The pillars are really just a way of categorizing the various systems that work together to produce a creative work. Thinking of them as the movement of a tool, applying some material to some kind of substrate, they become more relatable to the creative process we're already familiar with. Let's recap what we've covered so far. There are four major categories that describe the kinds of procedures used to make generative systems. These categories are called pillars. Each pillar corresponds to the various components of the creative process. Each pillar is of equal importance, so any could be used as a starting point. The movement pillar describes those procedures that involve changes in the values held by variables. These can be used in turn to describe functions such as movement and color changes. The most common of these procedures are movers. The tool pillar describes those procedures that generate a unit output such as a primitive geometry. The unit output could be abstracted through movement to generate emergent qualities such as forms, textures, and more complex geometries. It could be a single repetitive unit or a system of unit output. The material pillar describes those procedures that affect the appearance and relational quality of the unit output. The relational quality might be the use of transparency and opacity to blend and layer output for its emergent properties. It might be the use of stochastic conditions to stutter or stylize the unit output by determining when to execute procedures related to other pillars. The substrate pillar describes the manner in which the output's finally given to the viewer. We'll stick to the procedures that fall under this pillar, but there are steps related to other media that generative systems are used for, such as audio visualizations. For visual media, like a device monitor or practical output like a print, the substrate pillar relates to procedures that control the speed at which the program is performed by the device, the way the canvas is refreshed or not, the orientation of the canvas, either two- or three-dimensional, the layering of the graphics pages, the fidelity or density of the image, anything that has to do with the output page's attributes falls under the substrate pillar. That's quite a bit to take in for now, so I just want to leave you with that for a while before I begin relating the process pillars to an actual project that we'll make together. In the next part of this series, I'll demonstrate a practical exercise where I use the process structure method to create a generative system from the bottom up. As you follow along, you'll be able to put together your own design ideas into a generative system that will be entirely and uniquely yours. I'll guide you through the various examples of procedures you can use and where they fit into the process structure methodology. After that, the hardest part might be fitting the code together. I won't lie, this can be the most challenging part and it'll definitely test your understanding of any procedures you plan to use. Just like with practical art, it's all about technique at this stage. How well do you know the procedures? What things are you able to get them to do? And how do those actions fit into the pillars of process structure? These will be the things where in practice and familiarity will take you a long way. I hope you'll continue to join me in this deep exploration of generative art and designing generative systems. There's more to it than meets the eye and there's a lot meeting the eye, so it's natural to feel overwhelmed by all there is to learn. Just keep in mind that you can make some tasty dishes without learning every ingredient and all the ways of cooking them. There's so much room to grow in the medium, so let's keep learning, practicing, creating, and getting better at creative coding together. Thanks for joining me for this informative look at generative art. Please leave any questions or comments you might have. I'm sure they'll spark some interesting discussion. Until next time, thanks for the support and take care.